Welcome back everybody to SuperCloud 3 where we're digging into the intersection of cybersecurity, cloud and AI and it's our pleasure to welcome investor, entrepreneur and CEO of Rubrik, Bipul Sinha. Bipul, great to have you back in theCUBE, it's been a while. Thank you Dave for this opportunity, I always appreciate speaking with you. Yeah, so this is a third in our series of, of super cloud and cross cloud and, and I'd, I'd be interested in your sort of super cloud story and how you're thinking about about cyber, how the business is changing? If you look at the traditional cybersecurity industry, it has focused on uh, prevention of attacks. And collectively, we all spend $150 billion to prevent attack. But we all know prevention is not 100%. Otherwise, there will be no news of cyber attacks. So businesses on, and everybody has to think about another strategy that is the complement to the prevention strategy. And that in our mind is the resilience so that you can continue to operate the business even in presence of a cyber breach. And the combination of the prevention plus the resilience is the complete cyber strategy, zero trust end to end. So in our mind, uh, what you call super cloud is truly this data and application scattered all over the place from your private data center to uh, public cloud providers, to SaaS platforms. And how do you secure that data and make that data available to the right user on the, at the right time on the right platform for the right duration so that they can drive fundamental resiliency? Because if your data is available, you can reconstitute the business, restore the business and keep going. So in some ways, digital uh, economy, digital lives that we are all living, cyber is a tax to our digital economy. And as long as we can keep the tax low, we can continue to deliver digital goods and services to our customers, partners, the whole ecosystem and grow this economy. So our job is to combine this uh, prevention strategy with resilience strategy across super cloud, multi-cloud world to deliver fundamental business resilience. Yeah, so thank you for that setup. So when you think about this notion of, of data being the digital representation of your your business, the stakes are getting higher and higher. The problem is cybersecurity is so complicated. How do you simplify, how do you think about the future of cyber in terms of making it simpler for people to at least defend? If you think about the world today, the world today is, is folks accessing uh, services and the jobs of the CIOs and CISOs is how do they constitute and create a portfolio of services, whether the services comes from their own uh, private uh, ownership and maintenance of applications and data, or the services can come from cloud or SaaS, but they have to create this portfolio of services to reduce the risk and propel the business forward. Now, the question is that this portfolio of services, if you fast forward 10 years, is going to be how do we access or allow business users the access to this portfolio of services and what are the data that are living in these services. So the cybersecurity industry will have these two major components. So when I say access, it means that networking, endpoint, authentication, access management, and the data is all about user and data interaction. So as long as we can secure access and data, we can secure the digital future, we can secure the digital life. And that's where the cyber industry is going and everything will boil down to access and data. Okay, so it's an access problem and a data problem. I like the way you, you sort of frame that. Now you think about Rubrik, you, know, you transition from really a data backup, recovery, DR, data management company, really leaning in to cybersecurity. I mean, at RSA, you guys were all over the place, right at the corner of Howard Street. You had a, you had a really big presence <laughs> and made it known that you're in directly in this business. What were the most significant sort of findings and challenges that you faced in aligning sort of those traditional competencies with this new direction and actually how new was it? Was it more just sort of a natural progression? I wonder if you could just explain that for the audience. The backup and recovery industry was created to solve for human error recovery or the natural disaster recovery. And these two incidents are not very common. They are very infrequent, but for compliance governance reason, you need to have that infrastructure. But in the last 10 years, the biggest disaster is cyber disaster. And this is the core data strategy for every enterprise, every IT department. And our goal was to transform 
the legacy backup and recovery into a data security platform that not only drives the traditional backup recovery capabilities, but fundamentally gives cyber resilience and cyber recovery because that's the number one use case. That's the number one use. So if you think about businesses and how critical data is, data is the most critical asset of any organization. So if we can drive the data security, provide resilience to the business, then the business essentially becomes resilient and, and they can operate even in the presence of breaches because breaches will happen, it's inevitable. So the question is that, can you continue to operate? And that's where we saw the opportunity in Rubrik. That's what that's the vision we are driving. We are already the largest data security company. And we believe that there's an opportunity to really create this cyber resilience future based on the data security strategy. And when you think about risk models, it's the, the classic risk model is you got frequency and probability, you know, and then the, the degree of impact. And you're right, when it's a disaster, it's like very high impact, but you know, low probability it might have to happen one, once every 10 years. And that's sort of how you plan for it. Cyber completely changes that <laughs> equation. It's like high frequency, high probability, high impact, you know, all the time. So you really have to, you know, increase much greater granularity and flexibility and responsiveness. So I'm interested in how you do that across clouds. Like if you could talk specifically about your, kind of your deployment model, you've got the scale out, highly distributed architecture. Is it a single global instance across clouds or, or, or do you instantiate your stack in multiple regions? How does it actually work? We are very aligned to your vision for super cloud. In fact, the rubric security cloud, that is the single, place to manage and secure all your data across all your data states, across all the clouds, whether it's SaaS, on-premises, or, or uh, like uh, large uh, cloud service providers, it's a single place to manage it all. So in some ways we are delivering super cloud security, super cloud data security. So what we do is the, all the brain of the data security lives in Rubik Security Cloud and we keep the data next to the application so that we can do fast recovery upon a cyber incident. And that is the vision, but you manage everything with a policy driven platform so that you don't have to worry about whether your M365 getting protected with the same frequency and retention and resilience as your uh, AWS RDS resource or your private data center VMware resource, all protected with a single policy engine across everything. And that single policy engine, is how, is that how you create uh, not only a consistent experience across clouds, but synchronizing data? Because if, you, if you're distributed and you're close to the application, you have the, the possibility of being out of sync. Do you have to have magic that figures that out? Is that, is that right? Is that how you do it? So policy engine was our core innovation in Rubrik. And you are 100% right, because you need to have consistency in, in terms of and clubbing of, of different applications together in terms of how you secure the data and how you create a consistent data outcome so that you can restart a distributed application. And, and we do all of that with, uh, with Rubrik Security Cloud. But the most important innovation for us was making sure that all of your data is protected with zero trust architecture. And that was the core innovation of Rubrik plus the policy engine and plus the threat intelligence and event response that is built right into our platform. So what we really did was we took the concept of backup and recovery and took the concept of cyber um, security and data protection, com combined the two into a single platform that not only drives the classic backup recovery, but through a policy engine and automation, it really brings the threat intelligence and event response. So let's talk a little bit about AI. Cloud is code, code is now natural language. And the adoption of AI and LLMs and cybersecurity is increasing obviously at a very rapid pace. How are you specifically integrating AI into your cybersecurity solutions? And maybe you could share what unique advantages this brings to your customers and to, to Rubrik from a differentiator standpoint. The AI is a groundbreaking opportunity for the whole industry. Uh, we just announced uh, a partnership with Microsoft and, and a product integration where we bring Rubik Security Cloud plus Microsoft Sentinel plus the OpenAI Azure services together to really simplify cyber remediation, cyber recovery, and really lower the barrier to entry for somebody to really perform a cyber remediation, cyber recovery operations. 
and it shows that if you look at like there are a million open jobs on cybersecurity, there is a severe talent shortage. If we can apply artificial intelligence, the generative AI to lower the barrier and automate the cybersecurity response, it's a, it's a significant leap. But, but on the other side, generative AI is also helping people, bad people create more uh, malware attack, more ransomware attack. You have ransomware as a service that uh, that the bad players are actually renting to create more attacks. So in some way, we have to fight fire with fire. And in this world of machine to machine attack, we have to deploy uh, generative AI technology to really automate our security operations and really comprehend the cyber attacks because it has gone beyond human comprehension. And the only way we can comprehend is to augment our understanding with machine intelligence. And that's where the world is going. So do you think, and we've been asking everybody this, and we're getting some interesting answers. Ultimately, do you think AI is going to be a greater benefit to the defenders or the attackers? There is no finish line here. And it will be a cat and mouse game. They will have a um, upper hand. The bad players will have an upper hand and then good guys will come and, and fix it. And then it will continue. Look, at the end of the day, as I was saying before, uh, like cyber attacks is like a tax. You cannot avoid it. There is no way that you can say I can prevent 100%. You have to manage it. It is a risk management function. And as long as your risk is acceptable and low, you can continue to operate. So businesses have to understand what assets they have, what is the content of the asset and what is happening to those assets and make sure that they have a comprehensive strategy from prevention to resilience. So I'm curious, you mentioned Microsoft before, of course they're an investor in the, in the company and you as a, a former investor and sort of now you know, entrepreneur, risk taker, and I know your story a little bit, um, and you know, you had the nice cushy job at Oracle and, and, then, and then decided, we, we, went, we, we talked to you way back when uh, Nutanix was reaching escape velocity. So was you, when you see you know, what happened, the, the AI shot heard around the world and what Microsoft has done with open AI, they basically leapfrogged from a business model standpoint, everybody. I mean, it's actually quite remarkable. I'd love to get your thoughts on how you see the landscape, you know, with, with your investor hat on. I mean, what is most interesting is that we all are in the technology industry one step away from the greatest leap or the greatest disappointment. And the think about like Microsoft, a 40 year old company that is really defining the next biggest, possibly the biggest frontier of our lifetime and really creating product and defining that landscape. So we are now in this world of compressed time to scale and decay, compressed innovation cycle. And we all have to think about like, what is the next thing that has not been invented yet or known yet, broadly speaking, that can create this disproportionate opportunity. And Microsoft, to Satya's credit, took a big bet. And that bet was about AI's power to augment human intelligence. And how do you bring that power in the form of co-pilot across the gamut of applications so that you lower the barrier and gives this knowledge to every person in the world. And in some ways, AI, generative AI has, has uh, marked the end of the knowledge economy. And now we are in the intuition economy because anybody anywhere in the world have the knowledge of what has happened so far. Now the game is what could you create based on that knowledge? So I think you know your pivot to cybersecurity has it's got a lot of attention in the market, and now you've got this. We we've been talking about the heterogene heterogeneity inherent in multi-cloud environments, and then you got cyber threats that are evolving. This is this is just an unbelievable, like you said, cat and mouse game, unprecedented rates. So how does Rubric specifically stay ahead of these emerging threats, especially those? you know, whether it's related to ransomware, et cetera, but what, what measures do you have in place and whether it's part of the ecosystem or partnerships to adapt and swiftly respond to, to these threats? See, the thing is that one company cannot alone solve this problem and there is no silver bullet to this problem. So businesses have to have comprehensive strategy around making sure that the basic hygiene is done in our own Rubik Zero Lab reports, what we found was two thirds of the attacks are known 
problems that people didn't patch. Only one third of the attack is zero day. So think about it like the attacks are attacking our psychological issues where we click on an offer without thinking or we don't patch because we procrastinate. So, so the focus on fundamental hygiene, education, and making sure that we have the full integration and visibility across different tools that we are all using to be able to see end to end. I think the number one thing in cyber is visibility and control. And as long as, as an ecosystem of cybersecurity companies, if we deliver that visibility and control from data to infrastructure, that has been the traditional cybersecurity was infrastructure, we are bringing the data intelligence to it. That's where the answer is. Yeah, great, thank you for that. And I want to end back on, on, on AI. Uh, as the CEO, how do you think about the future of, of AI in, in cyber? Uh, it, you know, it's, we've been using a lot of analogies, Bipple, uh, this week in, in the super cloud, the, the Netscape moment, or even maybe better, iPhone, when you had the flip phone and then you saw the iPhone, wow. But at the same time, when you go back and look at the initial browser, you, you know, or dial-up modems, or uh, the, the first iPhone even, we think, many think people think that we're going to look back at what ChatGPT was and is in 2023 and say, wow, 10 years from now, five years from now, wow, did we come a long way. So as a CEO, how do you see the future of AI in cyber? Can you share any thinking or initiatives that Rubrik's working on that are going to leverage further AI in, in your future? So Rubrik uses AI to derive uh, security intelligence from data. So we have been doing this for several years and we'll continue to use make use of generative AI and other technology because most of the threats are about data sensitivity, which has huge language impact. But overall, if you take a step back and think about this AI generative AI moment, to me, it feels like we are living in 1999 where people intuitively grasp the power of internet, but the use cases and killer applications were still getting developed. And people took many different approaches and many different angles to uh, to the problem or to take advantage of internet. And 90% of those experiments failed. Few of them survived. So there was a huge run up, then there was a crash, and then there was a renaissance. That's the nature of the technology. So we are living in the 99 moment of generative AI. Lot of experiments, lot of ideas. Most of them will fail. Some of them will survive. There will be a crash. More applications will be developed than and then there will be a renaissance. But that is the natural cycle. You cannot short circuit and that's, that's how it will be. But what is very interesting is that fast forward five, 10 years from today, it will change our lives. I have one more question. You just made me think of when John Furrier and I were debating on one of the CUBE podcasts recently, you know, whether or not this was like the internet in that you basically just described it. You had a few companies, you know, obviously the, you know, Amazon, you know, eBay was another one that, sort of survived that, that crash, most went out of business, but you had incumbents that took massive advantage of the internet. I mean, take a company like Dell, they just supercharged their direct sales model. How do you see this era? Do you see it more like the, the, the internet or even, you know, some folks argue, well, no, it's more like the sort of PC wave where everything's going to get disrupted. How, how do you see it? I see it like an equal opportunity for incumbents as well as the startups. Because incumbents through few cycles have learned that they cannot stay away or look at the new technology as a toy. Because in the past, they looked at new technologies as a toy and that led to their disruption. So the incumbents are more prepared, more careful. And if you see the number of generative AI announcements from large players, it's astounding because the technology is still early. The models are still hallucinating, but still there's so much focus and attention. So in my mind, some of the incumbents will take advantage of it and become stronger. Some of the, some of the incumbents will go away. A lot of startup experiment will fail. Some of them will succeed, but uh, don't uh, kid ourselves. We are going to have our lives changed. Bipal, I don't know why we don't have you on more. I, I hope we can do this again soon. It was great having you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there for more content from SuperCloud 3 live in the Palo Alto studios and of course on demand at theCUBE.net. Be right back. <laughs>